Hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome to this week's Q and A's. Uh, there were only a few questions this week, so I figured why not wait till Friday morning to give everybody enough time to get their questions in and also just do it live so we can include everybody else. Because it's live, I'm sure there's going to be tons of fumbling and rambling and I don't get a chance to uh, go back and re-record any of the parts that I screwed up. So uh, feel free to point and laugh whenever you'd like, but I think let's just jump in and check out the different questions we've had. And then after I get through whatever the supporter questions are, I'll open it up to the chat and anybody else could jump in. So uh, please, you know, if you post a question while I'm in the middle of answering another one, don't think I'm ignoring you. This really is live and all that stuff. And if you're in the chat hanging out live, maybe you could just remind other people. I will, uh, as soon as we're opening it up to everybody, I'll let you know and I'll see if I could open up like a notepad and make sure to, to get all the good questions saved off. But for now, let's jump in and see what we've got over on Patreon. So first up, Vert Penguin wanted to follow up on the question from last week about their mister that had trouble with the HDMI output. And I had suggested um, going back to an older version of Mr. Fusion just to make sure it's not the new changes that Sorg added to uh, for the 24-bit analog output, and it still didn't work at all. So they said that they think they'll call it a day and look for a talented modder to try to fix it or just buy another mister and use this one analog only. So I do have an opinion, and this is only an opinion. You do whatever you would like, but if you know for a fact that you're always going to be using an analog outputting mister and this one's analog output is working perfectly, maybe leave well enough alone because it, you could find the best modder on the planet and if the port isn't the HDMI port and it isn't the DC barrel jack, then you've just paid a modder to fix something that, you know, might not even be able to be fixed. So unless, you know, you're on a tight budget and you don't have a use for analog output, I think just keeping it and using it as analog only might actually be the most cost effective method. And I realize that's crazy, but if you were planning on buying another one anyway, you might spend as much as the DE10 cost to get this thing repaired and up and running just to use it analog anyway. So yeah, I mean, that's where I, that's what I personally would do, but I understand if that's not going to be easy for you. Um, but I mean, you did talk last week about having to disassemble everything, having to resolder a bunch of stuff. So I'd leave well enough alone, but that's up to you. Also, just one question. They're from France and low, no little modders, except the famous FF6 man who's mostly dedicated to its Super Famicom thing. How should I look for an honest and good modder? Forums, Etsy, etc. Well, the easiest way is to just start asking around and to find people that are happy to talk about their work. While this is a, you know, a general answer and while this probably doesn't apply to everybody, if you, you know, if you're looking around for modders and you say, "Hey, do you have examples of your work?" If people are happy to send you those, even if the answer is check out my social media accounts. There's more examples than you'll ever need. That's actually a, a fair answer. And in fact, that's probably more fair because if the person was full of it, then all of the comments would be like, this is why what you're doing is wrong. This is terrible. So I would just look, ask for proof and just check around the community. But it's getting much easier now. As much as social media could be a total pain in the ass and you always get the customer that the customer did something wrong and blames the modder. It's just, it's the nature of the beast. You should be able to tell right away if there's a ton of people complaining uh, and especially other modders commenting because, you know, I'll, I'll call out my friend as an example because he's my friend and I'm going to do it anyway. People give Voltar a lot of crap. However, he's the first person to compliment a complete stranger on decent mod work. So other modders in their and their perspective on this stuff is also another good thing. So if you have somebody's social media filled with other modders who are known to be good, even if they're not in your area saying, Hey, that's good work. Or, Oh, that's awesome. But try flipping it in this direction next time. Or, you know, if you see people getting spoken to with respect, that means they've earned it. So that's probably a safe bet. Um, just watch out for fake pictures. There were some idiots putting retro RGB pictures that still have the watermark as proof of their work on eBay. It still happens, but not as much as it used to. So yeah, I don't know. Those are, you know, somewhat, somewhat decent advice for that. But let me, uh, let me mark this off. Let me take a sip of coffee and then uh, I will go on to the next question. So I guess this is. All 
right, let's see what we got up next. And just a quick reminder to everybody in the chat, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just gonna get through these couple of questions and then I'm gonna jump right into the chat and go from there. Um, and we just started, so if you're just jumping on now, I, there's only two more questions for the week and then we'll get right into answering right from the chat. So next up, Tony Escobar. Um, I'll just read the whole thing. Um, I don't normally, but why not? Uh, things have been running so smoothly lately, I had no questions until now. I have a modded GameCube from Stone Age Gamer with a Noka HDMI mod called Pluto. It replaces the digital out with an HDMI out. It's supposed to keep analog functionality. To be sure, they've reached out to Stone Age Gamer and have always had excellent customer service from them, so they expect to hear from them before this posts. But they're writing to ask for advice, but also highlight the troubleshooting steps that they've learned from these Q&As and stuff. Thank you, Tony. They connected their GameCube to one of the CRTs, and after flashing for a second with either the GameCube logo or launching into Swiss, the screen went dead. Um, so, so they did have analog out signal for a moment. So I'm going to pause and guess that what's happening is the Pluto mod is switching it into 480p mode, and that's why signal dropped out of the analog output, because in the GameCube, the analog output will never get more than 15 kilohertz, 240p or 480i. You could only get 480p from the digital out, which now in this case is the Pluto board, but let me keep going. They then connected their HDMI output to the LCD and it displayed perfectly, I guess correctly. They tried connecting via S-Video and Composite and got the same error. They changed the forced outputs to 240p and 480i and got the same results. Um, so just double check in the GC video settings. I think there's more than one place. I think you have to disable, uh, not only disable forcing uh, 480p, but you might want to check, are you booting to Swiss? Does Swiss automatically set to, uh, actually you did say you launched into Swiss. So I always set mine to go to 480p. So what could be happening is the GC video based solutions working perfect but then Swiss boots up and it is also working perfect and that as soon as it boots, it switches to 480p. So using your HDMI output, you might wanna go into Swiss and set the default to 480i. And uh, this is actually good if you're using on both 15 kilohertz and 31 kilohertz compatible stuff because as long as your HDMI output can accept 480i, which most can, even if it's laggy, at least if you set Swiss to always boot to that, regardless of what you're connected to, you'll always be able to change that setting. And just because you boot Swiss to 480i doesn't mean the game is going to launch that way. You could always launch, uh, set the game to launch to 480p. So my, my gut feeling is for you and your setup and anybody in a similar setup, just set it to 480i and don't even really worry about it. Um, so let me just keep going just in case I missed something else. Uh, should the, they found a, they went into their retro RGB toolbox and found a cheap DAC they'd purchased off the Amazon website for just a, an occasion. Thank you for using affiliate links. Those always help. Um, and that worked perfectly. That's interesting. So that might be doing one of the downscaling things or something, depending it. Uh, connected to S video through the DAC. So you're probably using one of those downscaler or converter boxes. Those are really great for testing, but I would actually go back and just set Swiss to 480i and that'll probably s solve your issue. But, you know, for the price of those things that I say tool in your toolbox, wasn't it neat to just plug it in and get a signal and use that for other stuff? So yeah, I would go back and go from there. But um, I think you're basically straightened out. I think you got a great setup and that's just that one tweak that you have to do. So let me... Yeah, let's see... All right, everybody, I think this is the last question. Um, and then we'll go switching to the chat for answering questions. Next up, Daniel Martinez Gonzalez has a couple of questions. By the way, how lucky am I that nobody had a, a hard name to pronounce this week? <laughs> for sure, sure. Where are you this week, buddy? <laughs> um, all right, first, it's re uh, regarding an acquisition of an OSSC Pro or a RetroTINK 4K. Right now, they have a regular OSSC, and their only real issue with it is it doesn't have a buffer mode for seamless resolution switching in-game, so they want to upgrade. They're kind of set on the OSSC Pro, but before deciding, they need to confirm the differences between both and the things that they care about to have a definitive answer. The RetroTINK 4K is quite more expensive. Yes, so it is, no doubt, and if you don't need the extra features, 
then it's a waste of money. If you do need the extra features, it's worth every single penny. I try to be very clear about this, and um, I think often the comment section in social media muddies the water here, but that's I've been very clear about that. So I wanted to reiterate, da reiterate to you, Daniel, for yours. Let me keep going, though. Next, the RetroTINK has very optimized settings out of the box, practically set it and forget it compared to the OSSC Pro. Yes, um, I'm really curious why a bunch of people didn't get OSSC Pros before the launch in order to start helping with this because the community that helped with the Tink 4K, um, they're a scalar agnostic. So I'm trying to make this as polite as possible, but the crew that was helping out wasn't helping out the Retro Tink 4K because they had their middle fingers up to the OSSC Pro and the Morph. They were helping out only the Retro Tink 4K because that's all they had. So while I'm pretty sure eventually you're going to get optimized settings and profiles for the Pro, it's going to be a long time because it took a long time to get it worked out on the 4K. So if you're looking for a solution right now, the, the 4K and I guess the 5X as well, the 5X would certainly do that because it has those pre-configured modes and there's a triple buffer to prevent resolution drops. It's just not as streamlined as the 4K with the profile stuff, but both of those would be great. The OSSC Pro is not there yet, and the Morph isn't there yet either. Um, so yeah, if that's important to you, Tink 4K. Also, just being able to swap them out on SD cards like that, super easy. Next, the Retro Tink 4K has the best artificial scan lines and CRT emulation. They don't really care about emulating different types of CRTs, but they're interested about dithering emulation for consoles that rely heavily on it, and the Retro Tink 4K does that. They don't know if the OSSC Pro does it, but their guess is no. I don't know, but it's certainly potential to have something something like that added in the future, especially with a developer like Marcus that's constantly giving us free updates years after the product released. Um, but you're right, uh, there, it isn't quite there yet. The only thing I'll mention to you about this, you might still never like CRT emulation, and there's nothing wrong with that. I just suggest making sure to try it if you ever move to a Tink 5X or 4K, because the CRT emulation is way different than the previous generation of scalers and depending on the content it really adds to it also what tv you're using is a big deal as well i've seen some very low quality lcd tvs that scan lines and crt emulation or it just looks like your tv is broken but if you've invested the money in an oled give it a try or not just oleds there's good tvs out there i'm just saying if you try crt mask emulation on a bottom of the barrel cheap lcd display like the monitors i buy and the secondary tvs i buy don't think that that's what it's always like uh next the retro tink 4k doesn't have support for analog video output the ossc pro does via an add-on so yes and no the ossc pro should have simultaneous dual hdmi and analog output via an add-on which is awesome and i love that feature the Tink 4K can have analog video output, but only that one output. So you would then take an HDMI into a digital to analog converter, either VGA, and then you could use the HD15 to start to plug it into SCART devices or component video. But you're right, it doesn't have simultaneous dual output. So if you were just like, hey, sometimes I want to downscale to my CRT, but most of the time I don't, the Tink 4K is fine. Same with the 5X. But if you were like, no, I want HDMI to my, you know, to my capture card or main TV, and then I want analog out to a CRT, the OSSC Pro is going to be what you need. Both support 120 hertz, 2K, and 4K monitors, digital video, video in, black frame insertion, HDR, different profiles, and have good support. Yeah, um, that's completely true. I think Marcus has been working on BFI stuff since the OSSC DEX. Um, I don't believe... It has any of the features for TV stuff, only video games, which it's not throwing shade against Marcus. He never once said that it was a scalar designed for anything other than video games and um, retro computers and stuff like that. But if that's something that's important to you, I've been annoying the heck out of Mike since the release of the original Retro Tank 2X about video stuff. So there's quite a lot of work that's gone into that. But other than that, if you're only talking about gaming and PCs, I wouldn't even consider that. But the 35 millimeter film emulation and uh, a lot of the 24p to 72p stuff, that's a huge deal for anybody that's into older content, to be honest. Um, 
Uh, next, please correct uh, correct them if they're wrong. Let me know if there's any quirk or characteristic you might be interested in but didn't put it on the list. No, that's really it. Just the only thing you might be missing is maybe a retro tink. 5x is all you would need for your setup maybe that's the happy medium between some of these extra features and not but it's up to you no there's no wrong answers here second question um they want to buy a new replica shells for the snes and dreamcast that have the same original colors or as close as possible do they exist not for the snes from retro gamer store but i hope that martin would consider doing a small run of all of his shells in original colors because i think a lot of people ask for that in fact, the only two complaints I ever hear about the Retro Gamer Store shells is they're expensive, which they are. You get what you pay for, though. And that they love them, but they also want original colors as well. And so that completely makes sense to me. Um, I don't remember about the Dreamcast, but you might want to check out Yoey's site. So uh, I will leave a link in the description as soon as I re-upload this video or, or edit it or something. But yeah, I should be able to take care of that for you. Uh, let me add that to my notes real quick and um let's see uh and lastly is there a proper tutorial on how to paint console shells i would go to russ lyman's social media page uh, i would check out a couple of the people who have done paint jobs and i i think that there are definitely better ways to do it i think there's certain type of paints that adhere to plastic better i think there's ways to clean it first that are better than others but i am not the expert in that i'm friends with russ lyman who's definitely more knowledgeable than me there's a lot of great people out there and so that would absolutely be a, a good idea and i also think that if you have like a cracked and yellowed shell and you don't know what to do with it painting it might be a good first thing to try because adding some paint and then maybe some sealant on the inside might actually save that shell and you know breathe a lot of new life into it so that's kind of where I would go for that. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, the last thing you said was they want to avoid spending a lot of money on a replica shell plus painting accessories and doing a bad job because they got bad info. Yeah, I'm always worried about that as well. Uh, so let me update my notes. We're almost ready to take questions from the chat. So if you have questions, let me know. Let me just update this. Uh, I'm also going to refresh all the pages to make sure questions didn't come in. Uh, nope. Here we got all the services are always welcome to ask questions. It's just the most uh, signups I have are on Patreon, which is why you often see those as the most. Uh, nope, that's everybody. So let me switch back to the main view. Actually, I wonder if I could put, let me put this in the main view and see if we could check the chat this way i don't know if this is going to work but we'll find out i guess okay so uh i am going to start taking questions from the chat then and uh let's see what we got let's um where are we at now 18 All right, let's see the first questions here. Let me let me scroll up and see if I missed anybody. Uh, the Mikey B86, they've had their consumer CRT modded, RGB modded, and insisted the modder use a VGA port for RGBS instead of SCART. They run a mister on it straight from the VGA port from Retro Castle's newest board to the analog, uh, newest analog board to the TV. Do they need to open the VGA cable and install a 470 ohm resistor on the sync line? I personally would, yes. I don't know if you have to. Um, you could add it on the inside of the TV. You could add it just on the sync line on the input of that D-sub. Maybe it are, your modder already did that. Um, knowing that, generally speaking, if people are going to use a D-sub, it's going to be TTL level sync. But I absolutely would, uh, without any doubt in my mind. And here's the best part. If I'm wrong and you don't need it, all that will happen is nothing. So then you turn it on, you don't get a signal, you don't get sync. So you remove that resistor, everything comes back on. Maybe your modder put it on the on the board. Maybe you don't see it there at first. No harm will come. Whereas if I'm right and you just leave it as is, you could be sending over voltage and kill that TV way quicker than you normally would have. So um, yeah, definitely Let me leave a note for that.
All right, let's see what we got for the next question here. All right. So uh, Rent Optional says, me and several others are getting ringing with optimal timing on Genesis with the triple buffer and the Tink 4K. If they mess with phase, if they turn off auto uh, decimation, they could fix it a little. No low pass filters are on. Any ideas? So this could be quite a lot of different things. So um, do you have a Model 1 Genesis you, uh, or is it a Model 2 or 3? If it's a Model 1, there are so many things wrong with that original motherboard revision that it, depending on the motherboard revs, you might not be able to fix that at all. It, uh, also, who did your installation? Has uh, has the brightness been checked? Have it been checked on a scope? Is it Because uh, don't forget, every one of these consoles outputs slightly different voltage. So if you lined up, even brand new from the factory, but especially 30 plus years later, if you lined up 10 of them and you put them all in a scope, all with the same cartridge running the 240p test suite or the HD retrovision suite, every one of them would output slightly different voltage. There's no such thing as identical in the analog world, especially with 5 to 10% uh, tolerant components. So it is also possible that you just have one that outputs very high voltage not high enough to hurt anything, but high enough to cause brightness and ringing and stuff like that. So let me uh, let me check the chat to see if you followed up with that. But it's a VA7, so basically a Model 2. So you should be fine with that. Um, you know, I would definitely go into any Discord servers that people do 3VP installations and check it out. It's been years since I've dug deep into the testing, but we dug real deep into that testing. So um, it's possible that there's something wrong with your... I don't want to say wrong, but there's something possibly up with your particular unit, but I would just kind of check around and see, and it should be doable. It should be fixable. Um, it could be other components. Maybe you needed to recap the rest of the Genesis, but unless it's really bad, I wouldn't obsess over it too much. Uh, after him. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, do I have an opinion on the summer 64 cart? I've heard good things, but I've never used it. Um, I just know that it's something that, or the summer cart 64. I just know it's something that a lot of people have talked about. And I hope somebody does, I hope somebody who knows a lot about the N64 will do a review of it. So, uh, I have no info for you at the moment, but I, th I think that has a lot of potential. Let's see what else we got scrolling through in real time. Uh, so Mikey just chimed back in about the RGB modded TV. Sometimes it looks very bright, like washed out colors. So it looks like then your modder may not have put 75 ohm to ground resistors on the RGB mod. So double and triple check all of that, please. Um, all right, let's see. All right, Colin Peterson said... Uh, they would like to work on designing a flex PCB to adapt a DOL 101 GameCube directly to interface with the Pluto board. They know that essentially both ends of that cable have been designed. Where could they start? They've done this mod before with wiring it directly to the GC motherboard, but, uh -oh, uh, but it could definitely be made easier, which could make it more useful. I would go to whatever service you're most comfortable with and check out the tools that they provide and then talk to other people in the community. Um, Maybe there's open source stuff already out there. Bordy, I know, is working um, has a couple of flex cables, and I would see what other people have done and kind of take their suggestions and go from there. And that's kind of a cheesy answer because I'm basically telling you go get your info other places, but I never pretend to be an expert in everything. And I do know that anytime you start a completely different project, like let's just say you were an expert PCB designer and now you switch to flex cable design, there's always a learning curve and there's always going to be mistakes. 
So maybe learn from other people's mistakes and kind of check in from there. But that's a pretty cool idea. And anything that makes these installations easier would be good. I am vaguely remembering somebody else, at least one other person talking about that though. So I would just double check and make sure it doesn't already exist. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm only bringing that up to say, maybe what you're looking for already exists and you just would rather buy one than have to make it from scratch, but totally up to you. Um, flex cable for Pluto install. All right. Historic nerd super chat. Thank you so much, Ian. By the way, I have your PlayStation video queued up to watch. Um, if it's as good as I think it is, I'll definitely be writing a post on it. Well, I'm a big fan of Ian's videos, but Ian said that four by three face cam makes me sad. Needs more 16 by nine Bob face cam, more Bob to love. Yeah, I don't know. I'm fat enough, dude. I'm going to leave my face in the proper aspect ratio and not stretch it. But the next time I play a game when you jump on, you know, I'm going to 16 by nine it for you. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's see what else we got. Um, and to make it easier, if anybody wants to ask a question, could you at RetroRGB in the chat so I could, uh, instead of reading every comment, I could just pick where I'm added. Um, thank you very much. All right. Uh, Lionheart just got a regular OSSC and they plug SCAR cables in and out frequently. They're afraid that's going to put wear on the connector. Is there such a thing to go in between to produce less wear? So I would not worry about this at all, to be honest with you, um, because you might be able to put something else in there, but then that might wear out. The connections might shift. So you might end up getting some video or audio blipping out and replacing the SCART connector should be fairly easy for even intermediate skilled modders. You just need a good desoldering iron. Don't heat it up too much. So you break the OSSC board. But just to put it into perspective, I've been using the same OSSC and since the HDMI mod, uh, HDMI model came out. Remember, it was DVI only at first, and I never leave anything plugged in. I'm constantly abusing all of my equipment because I'm never just leaving it plugged in. I'm always testing. Uh, if anybody saw the SCART coupler video, I also balanced my OSSC upside down on it, and it's fine. So I wouldn't worry about it at all. And I would just kind of see what happens. And if it wears out, then, you know, swap it out with a different connector. But you should be fine. Because if I beat up mine this bad with every different type of SCART connector, every type of adapter, I imagine you should be fine as well. So I kind of just wouldn't worry about this one. Um... All right, let's see what we got next. Uh, Owen Phoenix 79 said, it seems the Sega Saru has had some updates since it was covered. Do I know if the hardware is finalized and only firmware is left or is the hardware still being worked on? So this is a guess. I am not an expert at this, but I think the last hardware revision is probably going to be the last. And if there is, there might be a couple of tweaks left and now it's just firmware that's being concentrated on. But I'm going to wait for the Shiro crew to do a review on this thing because they are definitely the experts and I would trust their opinion over mine. So uh, I would just, if you're on the fence about getting one or if you want one, but you're not in a rush, I would just hold off because the other problem is finding reliable sellers that will sell it to you with the correct firmware loaded on it, the correct hardware revision, a quality 3D printed shell like the one uh, I just talked about. Uh, as opposed to one of the flimsy ones that who knows how long it'll last. So if you're not in a rush, I would just kind of wait to, for a Shiro review to come out. Uh, and if you are, then I, I don't know, I would just grab any one and cross your fingers and hope for the best. Um, damn it. Uh, Next up, uh, PTRJ, Peter J, just, just guessing on that one. Any pointers to convert HDMI Dolby Digital to LPCM for capture? They're trying to capture the HDMI modded Xbox audio and it only outputs surround sound via Dolby. They've heard some audio receivers do this. Yeah, I think you're going to have to go to a receiver. And I think Joe from GameSack said he runs his through an Xbox, uh, the newest Xbox's HDMI input, which could 
might convert it. I'm sorry if I'm screwing that up, Joe, but I know he definitely talked about doing that to, to mess with audio. But that's a good question. Maybe somebody else in the chat could chime in because I'm not 100% sure on that one. Um, let's see. Uh, GFD wants to know um, if there's any matrix switch out there that is compatible with the Tink 4K and will strip uh, HTCP. I, the last batch of HDMI equipment that's HDMI 2.1 compatible I tested didn't work well at all. Uh, I still haven't tested the one that Beast recommended. I'll get around to that at some point, but I don't have any recommendations at the moment. Um, so maybe the one that I'll just go back. If you go back a couple weeks, Beast recommended one. It's in the, the show notes for any of the Q and A's. I'll put that link up here. I got to just buy one and test it one of these days. But just know that it's uh, Beast definitely confirmed with normal equipment, but I don't think he has a Tink 4K yet. So I'll I'll leave a note for that, um, and I'll try to buy one at some point. All right, let's see what else we got. I'm trying to keep up with all the questions. Let's see. Um, Next up, Adam Adamant recently bought an Atari 7800. It doesn't have a power supply, and Console 5 doesn't have a connection for the rear plug. Do I know the technical name of that power connector? No, not at all. I would go to the Atari Age forums. At the very least, you might be able to do something like get the exact voltage required and then solder a barrel jack to it, uh, just like a pigtail one, to power and ground and run that out and match up the triad but I don't know what the pinout is of the 7800. Is it one of the weird consoles that uses multiple resolutions? Um, is there something specific about that power supply? I'm going to be totally useless to you on this one. So please just go back and uh, I would just check Atari age and see, um, you know, every forum is always hit or miss. You might get a group of awesome people or you might get somebody grumpy because you didn't, uh, I don't know why people get grumpy like that, but that's definitely where I would try. Um, and hopefully there's some kind of adapter that could be made to connect a triad to it because that would certainly solve some issues. Hold on one second. All right. Uh, GFD. Oh, wait, no, you already, already, already asked that one. Um, the Remora, I'm waiting on my HDMI only mister to be delivered from Retro Castle. Do I have a recommendation for an external DAC in the off chance they want YPVPR or just to use the one on the Amazon store? So there is an easy and a hard answer to this one. Um, let me try to uh, see if I can get you a link to this. Um, one second here. I'm getting it. Okay. So I'll drop it in this chat as well as in the, um, in the show notes here. So there's a couple of things that you're going to want to, um, to note. So this retro castle HDMI only Mr. Case that you ordered does output digital audio separately. So if you are already going into a setup where you could take toss link audio and go into some speakers that might have a digital audio input, then this is a very, very easy thing. All you would have to do is just go to the, the page that I just linked to and go to the cheap recommended DAC, which I believe is still available. And it's 10 bucks. It's made by Benfi, B-E-N-F-E-I. And it works as good as you could imagine for 10 bucks. Here's the problem. No audio support through that. So if you can get audio from a digital output, then absolutely that would work. And it would be a great solution. The other thing that you might want to work on, um, let me, so the other thing that I don't let me double check. This is even in stock before recommending. Yeah, I think it is. So the other thing that you could do is pick up the laser bear direct video adapter that uses the Ranky. Now the Ranky is both terrible and awesome at the same time. It's cheap. Uh, which means, which is why you can get a $30 adapter from LaserBear that does the component video conversion for you. 
and it is very compatible with a lot of different things. I was doing a couple of live streams where I used the Benfi and that, and the Ranky worked every single time I tried it. Uh, and it, the audio output on it is fine. For a cheap built-in audio DAC, it's fine. You're not going to, it's not going to win an award, but for the price, it is absolutely awesome. But the video output quality isn't as high as the Benfi. You're not going to have as even levels. It might be a little too bright. The, uh, the steps might not be as good. I did that interview with Kuro. I also linked to in the description to the write-up that he had done. So my personal suggestion is if you need analog audio, especially if you're going to YPVPR, get the Laser Bear adapter. Um, you could also get both. I mean, it, we're talking about cheap things here. So buying the Laser Bear adapter and the Ranky, and then also buying the, the Benfi, or maybe just buying the Laser Bear adapter without the Ranky built in, both of those are going to be totally fine. And I did use the Benfi with the Laser Bear. It, it fits, but it's not as snug. So you might even want to drop a little dab of hot glue in there, which is the perfect use for hot glue. Keep it sealed, but easy to remove if you ever needed to. Don't fill the whole thing up with it. Just put a little dab. But either of those are definitely going to be good solutions. So if I were you personally, um, and this is just a suggestion, so don't, you know, don't feel locked down to it. I would just buy the Laser Bear adapter with the Ranky. I would get your component video and audio output right from there. And then I would just wait. Maybe the community built solution, which the developers kind of been ghosting me for months, so I'm not sure whatever happened with that. But if that's released, that's going to be the best deck because it's going to be designed with Mr. in mind. So you're not going to have any of the issues that we talk about. And the audio deck is going to be absolutely decent. I always have to be very realistic with audio because you could spend five thousand dollars on just a DAC more than that to be honest but in the context of gaming the equal to or better than original consoles so that's what i would suggest for now i do know it drives curl crazy when i recommend the uh the ranky adapter but all the reasons i just said are why and if this ends up being a tool in your toolbox and uh, you pull the ranky out and put a better one in in a month maybe we've determined another one that does have audio like the benfi cool. Now you just have an extra converter sitting in your toolbox that you're almost surely going to have to use at some point. So definitely a recommendation for there. Uh, let me um, take a sip of coffee and then we'll see what other questions we got. Next up, GFD is looking forward to the VHS capture breakdown video. Any foresight on when I would make it with all my findings? So uh, thank you. And holy crap, when I started going down that road, I had no idea it was going to be this detailed. And I had no idea it, it, it was going to be this much work. I would have never gotten this far if it wasn't for Fudo. So shout out. Thank you again. In fact, retro RGB probably wouldn't be a thing without Fudo. So <laughs> double thank you. Uh, but the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know, which is very common in the tech world. So what I decided to do for my own sanity is first release a video showing how to use the RetroTINK 5X and 4K to digitize your tapes or laser discs or whatever else. In that video, I make it very clear that that's not always going to be the best solution. And sometimes going direct 480i for archival stuff would or depending on what you're looking to do with it, how you're looking to edit it, et cetera, et cetera. Funny enough, though, in my testing, in the scenarios in which you use Doomsday or Direct 480i and Doomsday or just one or the other, I have found scenarios in which you have now your digital 480i copy and you run it through something like an OPPO Blu-ray player that could do direct video. So it does 480i over HDMI without any issues. It sends the exact signal you might actually be running it through the RetroTINK 4K again after you've already captured to 480i because if you have mixed content, there absolutely is a scenario where it would do a slightly better job than certain post-processing effects. Not always, and in fact, there are definitely cases in which you would want um, 480i captures and, and scale and post and for any archival work. Like, So I guess here's the best way to put it. If you are doing a ton of tape transfer, and it's stuff like, hey, I have old home movies. Um, you know, I got fun stuff for my family and I want to just get those on YouTube or whatever. 
putting it through a tank and sending it to YouTube that way is by far the easiest. You don't need a time-based corrector. You don't have to worry so much about comb filtering, especially if you have a 4K. And you hit record on your capture card. When you hit stop, you're done. You just upload it. And it's totally fine. However, if you said, I have only one of five VHS tapes left on the planet of something that I need, I would go the exact opposite and go to Doomsday. Because not only are you taking that raw capture, the way Doomsday works, you could rip all five of those and then put them together. And the software that's created will take the best parts of each and mix it together. Essentially having a far better copy than you ever could out of just one of them. Even though VHS is only 250 TVL and lossy and yada yada, it's still going to be better. And then if you're somewhere in the middle, maybe you have a family member that passed and you found a tape with the only footage of them ever. Going direct to 480i might actually be better simply because you could do a lossless capture, which is big, but not any bigger than a 4K compressed capture, and then go from there. Maybe you want to take that footage and scale it in post with software. Bra uh, BravoCon, I've been talking to Simon again about adding more features for VHS stuff. Maybe you put it through a tink. Maybe you just upload it as 480i, which I don't ever suggest because it's not going to look as good. But at least you have the original copy there. And if it's important to you, that's something that is something to consider. Price, though, is going to be a massive factor. If you can't find a good time-based corrector, you're probably not going to be able to get good copies with the audio and video staying in the sync. So you'll end up spending more than just a Tink 4K and an Avermedia Live Gamer 4K on if you can't find any of the other ones and you have to buy like the data video. Uh, you'd want a full-frame time-based corrector, which the, the Tinks essentially have built in. So there is actually a scenario in which you would spend more on just one piece of equipment than a Tink 4K and a capture card. And the only difference is the if you're using composite, the comb filter is 90% as good as something like an Osprey card. And the time-based corrector is 85% as good as a standalone. The audio and video stay in sync. You just might get a couple more dropouts, but everything stays in sync. So... You know, I, I'm probably rambling too much in a Q&A about this, but basically, even if you're in a pro environment and you still want to do some kind of direct capture, I think a tank is still something to consider. And I, I actually think that um, even people doing Doomsday, you might want to pick up a tank 5, 5X or 4K. And Doomsday is capturing to its device, the FPGA device, and you still need to play it through something. So play it through a tank so that you have a 1080p or 4K copy and you have that raw copy and now you have the audio and you could compare the sync to both of them. So even if you're using a pro solution, using a tank with it might actually be the answer. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. I'm sure you weren't expecting a freaking 10 minute answer to this or something, but, um, but yeah, it's unless you know you're doing archival work, you know, like Kenny. Kenny is absolutely gonna get, need a tank and an Osprey card, and a Doomsday solution, and he's probably going to be using a combination of all of them every time. But if you just have a stack of old uh, tapes, I would go with the Tink. The only other thing which I'm not going to get into in the Tink video is if you have family members that are not super tech savvy that want you to digitize their tapes, finding a good DVD combo device is going to be the easiest. Because yes, you're going to get MPEG compression on that DVD. However, you can teach almost anybody, especially like the Samsung player I have, it's a one button push to go from VHS to DVD. Then when you're done, you go through the menu, you just write down the steps for your relatives and you finalize it. And if they hand you a stack of 15 DVDs, ripping those to your computer and sending them to YouTube is going to take hours. Whereas taking those tapes, getting it to digital and getting that to YouTube is going to take days. <laughs> so there are absolutely still scenarios in which a DVD combo unit is going to work for you. So, all right. Uh, VHS. Uh oh, there we go. But yeah, the, the short end of your question is I'll get to the VHS one eventually, but it's going to be months. Cause I still, I want to finish the tink one. I want to get the feedback. I want to do more testing. I want to mess with doomsday a little bit more. The Doomsday Discord is ridiculously friendly, like uncommonly friendly. So um, it's going to be pretty easy for me to go in and, and ask some questions and, and get some help there. Um, all right, let's see. 
Um, where are we at? All right, next up, uh, Arcade Ages has a PBM 2030 that is too bright when they use it with an Xtron. They think it's getting too high voltage. Is there an adapter they could buy to solve this? What Xtron? If you're talking about a cross point, there could be dip switches on the back that you need to flip to 75 ohm mode. If you're talking about an Xtron RGB interface, very often they have gain controls that can raise the brightness to a dangerous level. So turn those back down. Um, but that's absolutely what you would have to clarify. And in fact, I am going to take a sip of my coffee. And if you're still here, give you a moment to respond. Um, well, also, I could use a break. <laughs> I usually get at least uh, one water or pee break when I'm doing these pre-recorded. I quit coffee a while back. And then I had sleeping issues. So I started drinking coffee again. And now I, I think I'm addicted again. So I'm going to try to cut this, uh, cut this habit. But it's just delicious and it smells good all right okay arcade ages responded it is a cross point so um this is this is going to be very easy then if you can somehow plug your console directly into whatever you're using like uh actually how are you getting it into the cross point do you have custom console to bnc cables and what are you going into so you're going out of the cross point into a scaler a tv um the easiest way to troubleshoot, like let's say you're using RGB SCART cables um, through a SCART to a BNC adapter, or maybe you have custom BNC cables like the ones Retro Access and Retro Gaming cables sell, and you're going into a PVM. If that was the case, plug it directly into the PVM. If it looks fine and you run it through the cross point and it's too bright, try a different input, try a different output. And if they're all still too bright, look for dip switches on the back. If you have no way to test directly, the cable could be bad, um, but that's not as likely. So let me see if you had time to respond to that. The setup is to six PVMs and eight consoles. PVM 2030 is the only one without BNC. Hmm. Then check the dip switches on the back of the PVM. If you're talking about that printer cable, printer port looking thing, if you're you're under 30 you have no idea what i'm talking about but all my fellow old people if you remember that printer socket thingy um there could be some kind of termination switch there um let's see Uh, let me, I can see another question here. Let me look up the, uh, the link for that answer first. I think this is it. Okay. Um, All right, so next up, um, uh, Seth, uh, Seth Justus wants to know a recommendation for a DAC to play one, 192 24-bit audio, uh, specifically trying to max out Apple Music on Windows 11. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat right now. It's an affiliate link. So if you think I'm lying about this to make my pennies off of a sale, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm, I think I'm legally required to, to say that. Um, but I just have to reiterate that you could spend more than your average brand new car on a DAC. So when I give audio recommendations, it's always within context. And within the context of affordable sub $200 DACs, the ship Modi, and I'm not swearing, that's the name of the company, uh, is the best I've ever heard. That was a recommendation from Matt from Insurrection Industries. Uh, he's an audiophile, but he's a realistic audiophile. He's not somebody that's going to drop $100,000 on a deck, 
it'll probably drop a couple of grand, but enough so that um, to understand the differences. So if you really can hear, you know, if your hearing is good enough to hear a difference and you have a stereo that's, I don't know, up to, uh, if you have a, uh, a music audio system that's a grand or two grand, this is probably going to be the perfect act for you. If you have a $5,000 home audio system, you're probably going to want to upgrade. Um, and I wouldn't even be able to give you a recommendation at that point. I keep bugging my friends who dabble in audio design to try to help build more products to bridge the gap between the ship Modi and the multi-thousand dollar stuff. But that's definitely the one that I would go for. And uh, it looks like other people in the chat have uh, have agreed. So yeah, that's um, just a basic recommendation. But we could go over DAC stuff for days and it gets to the point where it's all about preference. And if you really wanted to get crazy, you might even prefer one DAC for one type of music and another DAC for another. So whatever. But that's definitely my my overall go-to. Let's see what we got. All right, next up, uh, Frank Bazoko wants to know if the Rad 2X will ever be back in stock. They think they'll work really well with the RetroTINK 4K. So I have two answers to that. I don't know, but I hope that Rob gets them back in stock as soon as he can, because I still really think that is the, the answer for a lot of people, especially somebody who's like, my favorite consoles are the Wii, the PS3, and you know, maybe the Switch. But, oh, by the way, I also have an N64 or a Super Nintendo or something else. I think it's just the, the perfect solution. Uh, now, uh, they probably aren't going to be the best solution to work with the RetroTINK 4K because you're not going to be able to take advantage of every single feature. Now, one of the things it does in order to get the product as cheap as it is, because while it's not a cheap product, it's certainly way less expensive than you would expect for essentially a tink in a box, it's going to output 422, I think it was 422 at 480p. So if you're going into a RetroTINK 4K, buying HD RetroVision cables or quality SCART equipment is going to actually get you a better output through the TINK 4K than RAD 2X because you're getting that raw analog signal. If you're letting, I mean, if you're buying a RetroTINK 4K, you're letting a $750 device with its very high-end analog video processing do the digitization not a small little device that's essentially just designed to be a zero lag line doubler, which is not an insult, obviously. It's just two completely different use cases. So I personally would re recommend the RAD 2X for lots of reasons, but not going into any HDMI inputting scaler, unless it's, unless it's like the scenario I just said before. You know, it's your only analog video outputting console and you have an OSSC Pro or more for a Tink 4K. Yeah, fine. But if it becomes something that's important to you, you're probably going to want to just get an analog video cable and, and use it as a spare backup or something like that. Um, all right, let's see what else we got. Oh, man. Well, this is embarrassing. Uh, Rumble Mints wants to know what my go-to Starbucks order is. It should be just uh, dark roast black coffee, except I quit eating all sweets and candy and sugars actually the day before retro world expo last year. So the only like sweet thing I get is the, the mocha. I usually get a small, but I knew I was doing this live stream today and I wanted to keep the energy high on a very gloomy, rainy, foggy day. So yeah, I get the fat guy got a gazillion calorie mocha, but I'm going to dial it back to just get a regular dark roast again. So yeah, I, I, you know, I try not to be so fat, but sometimes I just can't really help myself. And if I had to choose between coffee calories and beer calories, it's going to be beer. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you know, I, I can't be perfect, right? But I still haven't had a single cookie, piece of cake, donut, sweets, and I rarely even eat after dinner anymore other than, you know, beer, which is essentially a meal in itself. And I don't feel any different. I don't feel any healthier. I don't feel any worse. Um, I went to the doctor and all of my levels were the same. 
So medically speaking, it's useless, but I can't be doing a bad thing. <laughs> so yeah. All right. Uh, next question. Enough rambling on about my, my stupidity. Um, okay. Next up, Brandon Arnold said, uh, good to see you. I wish you could see my home and read my mind and tell me something I should want. Well, Brandon, uh, we've actually been going back and forth for a while, and I have a feeling I could answer this question. If you were a complete stranger, I, I, I might give you a recommendation like you want a RetroTink 4K, but with the setup that you have and all of the, the RGB monitors and everything else, I would think that if you... For your setup, you're going to want something weird that not everybody else is doing. And I would go with something TV related. Now, uh, I believe that you have a Betamax player. So running that into any one of your monitors or through a Tink 4K or both at the same time, if you want to get crazy, might actually give you a pretty unique experience that very few people on the planet have ever experienced especially reverse telecine a 24p movie going into an oled and adding black frame insertion while at the same time you're going into your pvm to watch it at 60 hertz like there's a lot of cool stuff you could be doing with your setup so if i were you i would recommend anything weird or any new uh any new tools in the toolbox coming up there is one rgb to composite s video converter coming out that's the best i've ever tested and while most people wouldn't need that at all, which if I do a launch video for it, it's, I'm going to open with saying most people don't need this, but there are absolutely are many people with a setup that's like, I got RGB cables for all of my consoles. They sync on C-Sync. I have a G-SCART switch. Everything's perfect. I go into a scaler and a small PVM, but I just picked up a giant 32 inch CRT that only has comp uh, composite video inputs. I want to use that too. That's the perfect scenario because what are you going to do rebuy all of your rgb cables sync on composite and then you get a converter just to pull the composite off the sink you absolutely could and i would actually design your setup that way to begin with if you knew that was something that you wanted i have one of my carts set up that way i'll be doing a video on as soon as i get the new cables in but it would actually if you already had sync on c-sync cables this converter would be cheaper and it would work 90 five percent is good depending on the console so yeah if i were you brandon i'd get weird because you have a very cool setup and there's a lot of weird and neat things coming up but tv related stuff i think you might want to be interested in fun toys all right let's see what else we got Uh, Sasquatch in time recently saw the ocean collective and they were amazing live similar ish to tool, um, seen anyone lately or looking forward to any live. I haven't had a chance to see many live shows. I believe the iron maidens are coming to the East coast for the first time that they're, they're awesome cover band. Um, Sammy Hagar and Joe Satriani are coming this summer. And I think those are the only ones. Oh, um, Oh, Steven Seagulls. That's uh, the, you know, the folk band that does metal covers. Those are probably the ones that I'm going to be seeing. And of course, anytime Answer Infinity plays, you could see me there. And if you ever walk into an Answer Infinity show and you see somebody shirtless screaming like Jason Kelsey, it's me. So, <laughs> yeah, I uh, highly recommend if you're in the, the New York area. Let's see what else we got. Uh, Jeff Lang wants to know what retro games I'm currently playing. I don't really have time to play uh, at all, basically, anymore. Only really the live streams that I do. But I plan on doing a live stream of the current NES to SNES conversion of Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. Because I haven't featured that developer before, which is only because of time. That is not at all a dig against the developer at all. I just haven't had time to cover the content yet. And I've never played that game. So I would love to spend like 20 minutes playing it on the NES and then 20 minutes playing it on the SNES and then go back and forth. And even if I'm really terrible at it, and even if I don't like it that much, the game, not the conversion, 
I think it still would be a fun learning process and just to see the differences like I did with the developer infidelities conversions. So that's definitely going to be my game coming up. Um, that's basically it uh, for now. But I'm always interested to see what comes next. And I hope I have more time in the future. Maybe I could just do like a Wednesday night play a game live stream or something just to force myself to get into gaming a little bit more. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, that's it for the moment. Let's see what else we got. Next up, uh, Durf is hoping to go to Retro World Expo this year. What am I planning on doing here this year? They've only been to PRGE. Not sure what to expect. Well, first, really, really looking forward to meeting you in person, Durf. Durf's the one that does the console mods wiki. He's been absolutely great to work with over the years. So super looking forward to meeting you in person. Um, the first thing I got to just set your expectations. Retro World Expo is about quality, not quantity. I'm not shitting on PRGE. I'm just saying... PRG is a giant, massive expo where it just it fills a whole expo hall and you could walk around for hours. And Retro World Expo is much smaller, but they have a lot of great vendors, a lot of very good guests there. I don't know if they're getting the wrestlers back, but that was shockingly one of my favorite parts. I was just talking to somebody the other day last year. I always try to go over and watch them because they really give it their all. And there was, you know, the, the bad guy was getting beat up by the little dude. And they, he throws him out of the ring and there's like a little girl dressed in video game cosplay in the front row. And the, you know, the good guy, the little dude runs over to the little girl and goes, kick him in the shin. And she gets super into it because, you know, she's dressed up as a video game character. Now she wants to fight the bad guy. And she really wails him right in the shin. He had boots on, obviously, so it wouldn't hurt anyway. But I was crying laughing. The mom of whoever the kid was is crying laughing. She was shocked to see her daughter do that. And the, the bad guy absolutely played into it brilliantly. It was just, it was one of those moments where it's like, you know, it, it's so cool to see people give their all and really put on a great show, whether it's a band, a wrestling act, whatever else, speakers at the expo. And that's the third year in a row that they've brought it every time. And it just, it makes such a difference for the crowd. So I think while I'm talking about a wrestling example, that is probably a good way to describe retro world is people really bring it. You know, not every vendor is going to be perfect. Not every panel is going to go well. There were a few interesting ones in the past. <laughs> there was one right after me that I always kind of laugh at because the people we went over, but I'm, I'm really like, I try to be well-mannered everywhere I go unless, you know, unless somebody does something first, but we were going over our time and we even sent people out like, Hey, would you, is there anybody waiting for the next panel? We could keep taking questions. There was nobody outside. There was nobody in there. And about three minutes after the hour, somebody runs in screaming like, are you done yet? We're starting to wait for our panel. And we're like, Oh, we're so sorry. We scurried out. And I came back three minutes later and they were just standing there and nobody was there. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. There's a there's always one winner like that every year, but for the most part, they're they're always great. So highly recommend it. But um, I mean, let me just... next up, a super chat from Adam Stalker. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the super chats. They're absolutely what keep these things going. Um, I probably should have skipped your question just because it was a super chat, but I'm also trying to take notes and keep everything up in the show notes as well. So I apologize for not getting to you as well. Do I recommend using Mr. into the OSSC pro will effects like composite blend on Genesis still look good through direct video. If I remember correctly, uh, stuff like the composite blending still definitely does look great through direct video. However, I don't understand exactly what you can get by running it through the OSSC pro you might be able to get um, BFI. So it's possible that if you wanted to go 1080p 120, so that you have every 60 frames of the normal frame, then a black frame for smoother motion on an OLED, it's very possible that you will gain, uh, that you would be able to use that and it would be pretty cool. But I'm not really sure what other advantages because both the OSSC Pro and the Mister can do basically the same resolutions. Um, Whereas if you're going through something like the Tink 4K, you get the CRT mask emulation and or BFI depending and you get the automatic profile switching over to it. You get the auto zooming. So 
it's it certainly wouldn't hurt anything at all and if you if bfi really was your focus that could certainly be something to try but i vaguely remember 720p 120 working on the mister now don't quote me on that because it could have just been one of the times i was annoying one of the mister devs to help me out with a custom mode line just to try something as an experiment so maybe it's an unsupported thing that barely works and but I think at the moment, and by the way, I'm a huge fan of Marcus's work. I love the OSSC Pro. I just always try to be realistic. At the moment, I don't really under, understand if there would be any advantage to going through the Pro other than you have all of your consoles running through the Pro anyway. So rather than switch HDMI inputs on your TV, you just use that. I mean, for simplicity, if you already are going to buy a Pro and you already own a Mr., why not, right? Um, but I don't think the advantages are, are there yet but I don't really know what's coming next. So I don't know. Uh, I'm going to just answer this one with, you probably aren't going to gain anything now, but it might be in the future. So uh, let me know if you want me to elaborate a little bit more on that. I, I think at the moment, um, it's not really going to give you anything, but composite blend would definitely still work at least somewhat. It'll, it'll give you the effect you're looking for. All right, Mr. GG. Let's see what else we got. Hey Ariel, we already talked about the Saru, but if you got a new question, I could certainly uh I could certainly try. Let's see. Rumble Mint said Mocha's your drink as well. Okay, uh I actually let, let me talk about that for a minute. One seventy five. Oh come on, my my note-taking thing isn't working as well as it usually is. So Ariel wanted to know, would the Saru cart complement the mode they already have in their Saturn? At the moment, here, and once again, the Shiro crew are the experts on this, I'm guessing. But at the moment, I think you would get any of the advantages that you would get of any expansion car cart. So the RAM, uh, being able to transfer saves... And the Saru, if you have the correct version and the correct firmware, would actually load games faster in most cases. So at the moment, the mode that you have would be used for the very few games that aren't compatible with the Saru, but you'd probably be going mostly to that. So um, I don't know if you've already spent the money on it. I don't know if I would recommend getting it because you've already spent the money on the mode. It already works. I would probably rather see you get a cheaper... Um, like the red cart where you could select which RAM module you want and still have all the other access. But if the Saru cart really starts to get ironed out, what I would actually recommend is using that. And it could allow you to boot backups so or, or different region games. So if you don't have or the one or two games or the, what is it, the 5% of the games that don't work are ones that you want to play, you could always burn a CDR of it, assuming your laser still works. But yeah, it's, it's, um, I don't know if you would get much out of it for complementing the mode, I think it might be better used standalone. But once again, I'm not an expert. If anybody knows in the chat or, you know, maybe the Shiro crew will include that in their review. So, um, all right, let's see what else we got. Hey, Felipe. Uh, so, I originally was going to do the 300th live and uh, I guess you could call it that. But for me, there was only three questions pre-written. So anytime there's going to be something like that, unless one of the questions requires like a 20 minute answer, which happens every now and then, I think I'm going to going live is going to be my go-to. So if I get there on Thursday night, Thursday afternoon, and there's only a few questions, I'll probably always do it live. And that usually happens specifically at different times of the year, spring and fall, when the weather starts to change uh, or right before a holiday. So there might be a couple of year like that, but yeah, we'll see. Um, where are we at? Uh, so... Cat Motto wants to know how I organize my EverDrive SD cards for consoles with large libraries. All just dumped in the main directory, each letter with their own directory. Uh, I have 
I go by the smoke monster packs from years ago, and there's still tools that allow you to make your own. So maybe you could find one uh, floating around in dark parts of the internet, or maybe you could get your own ROM packs and run the smoke monster tool on it to sort those out for you. But that's what I do, and those are pre-sorted in all of the, the different subdirectories. And I just find them, they just make my life infinitely easier. So you might wanna search around for those and see if there's places that might still have it. Um, or you could just try to get any ROM dump set and use those tools to, to do that yourself. Uh, if anybody has links, maybe DM me on Discord or something, and I could add the links to the description to the, because I forgot where to get the Smoke Monster tool. Not links to ROMs, I can't post those, but the tool is, there's nothing proprietary about it, so it's totally legal to post. So, uh, do, let's see what else we got. All right, I'm going to skip over to a super chat from Bowie. Um, thank you so much, Bowie. Much, much appreciated. Have I ever interviewed the people from Electron Shepard? Not yet. It'll happen, definitely. Uh, they bought both their AVI HDMI and their Wii dongle, and those are great. Uh, so I've tested them both. I still have the Wii one here. I haven't done a live stream yet. My apologies to Electron Shepard. It's not at all intentional. But they're also working on a couple of other things that I've been going back and forth with them, and one I've even been helping test. So you're going to be hearing a lot more from them, especially this year. But there's one thing that they've made that I really do think uh, a lot of people are going to see the value after it's released. One of those things that like, you're probably going to, I don't even want to say it out loud because you'd hear about it and you'd be like, oh yeah, I guess I could use that. But if I do a launch video, which hopefully I'll have time to do, and you see it in action and you have the visualizations of what it could do, you'd be like, oh shit, I think I might need one of those. So yeah, um, nothing but good things. They've been great to work with. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, hopefully I'll interview them soon. All right, let's go back up. Uh, Frank Mazzocco wants to know if I use <coughs> pedals or effects processors for guitar. They equate the processors to using emulators for retro games, but the ease of use could not be overlooked. So I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go too long with this, but my whole life being a guitarist and a nerd, all I've ever wanted to do is play with pedals. And when I started, uh, I think two bands ago, I realized I was spending far more time messing around with the settings than I was actually playing. Just like when I was messing around with software emulators, I spend more time messing with that than playing. So I just wanted to find a tube amp that worked. I found a Laney Ironheart, which still, to get a really good sound, you wanted to use another pedal as well. I basically stole the idea from Kill Switch and Gage. Uh, and then it was great. But then I found the EVH 5153 amp. And it was the only time in my life I had ever plugged my guitar in, put the knobs to what I normally have them about, hit one chord and went, oh, that sounds like me. That sounds like what I've always been waiting for. So that's the amp I ended up using live for a while. I, I had a whole bunch of other things I tried. I tried just the 15 watt Laney Ironheart rack mounts and then going through house speakers. The other band members didn't really understand what I was trying to do with that. So they, they kind of hated it because they didn't quite get it, which is not... I'm not throwing shade, right? We're, they're musicians, not deep dive nerds like I am. But that was the one that I was, it really made such a big difference. However, whenever you're changing things, like what if you're going from distorted to clean, but you also want reverb? Or what if you're going from uh, medium channel to heavy channel, but you also want an effect for a solo? You're basically doing a tap dance on stage. So my friends have switched to the, the fractals and the Kempers. And for a long time, I could still hear the difference between a fractal and an original amp, especially if it's one of the amps that I used. I, I know my hearing's oddly still weird, even for somebody in their 40s. But the Kemper, I was never able to tell the difference between original amp and the Kemper. So if I started playing live again, which I think I've played guitar four times in the past two years, so it's probably never happening again. I should probably just sell my guitars. But if I did ever play live, what I would actually want is the Kemper floor pedal to do the distortion and the effect emulation 
and run it through the EVH5150 clean. So I'm still getting the same cab, I'm still getting the same amp, but the only things I'm emulating are the distortion of that amp, which the Kemper does. I mean, I could probably do a, a Kemper with the amp built in, you know, the power amp into a house cab and have it sound identical, but I feel like that's a happy medium. And then if I were to ever play a gig where there wasn't room for my amp on stage, anybody that's ever been in an opening van before, no explanation needed, then I could just go direct into the PA and like have an inner ear. So for me personally, I like in the dead middle because I still could hear, a, uh, I could hear fake stuff, except reverb. I don't think any human could tell the difference between good fake reverb and actually being in an echoey room. But yeah, the, the album that I did, I still love it. I still love the music. I, respectfully, I don't really care if anybody else likes it or not. But the drums sound so fake, it drives me crazy. We were told we were getting real drums. They were all triggered, which drove the drummer crazy because she did a badass job on those songs. And she was almost embarrassed when it's like, it doesn't sound like the drums where I was in the room with them. So that was, that was annoying. But the songs were good, and I just don't really like the digital plugins. So for me, uh, that's exactly what I'd do. And for recording... I don't know if I would ever be able to tell the difference between a Kemper run direct into an audio interface versus a mic'd amp. And in fact, the only differences I've been able to tell when my friends and I have done these experiments are whenever we messed up miking an amp, you could hear that, whereas you couldn't really hear it on the Kemper. So that's those are probably where I personally would go. But I listen to mostly hard rock and metal. For, or I play mostly hard rock and metal. I listen to everything. Um, but yeah, those are mine. Uh, those are kind of my opinions on that. Um, digital processors. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, I'll probably do another 20 minutes of this too, if I, just so anybody wants to get their questions in. I'll have a cutoff at some point. I won't just cut the stream on you. Uh, Richard uh, Matheny Jr., does the 8-bit do Bluetooth receiver for PlayStation 1 and 2 have lag? Uh, you would have to check the latency, any of the latency databases that are out there. I haven't personally tested them, but uh, the Mr. database is the one that I would go by. Game Padla is awesome. I'm so happy that exists. I, I really appreciate the work that John and Anna have put into it, but the way they're doing it isn't going to be as accurate as Mr. So testing your home setup, Game Padlet would probably be super easy, but if you have a mister and you have the ability to build one of those or maybe buy a lag testing kit, which may or may not be coming available soon, that is absolutely the, the most accurate way to do latency testing on controllers. So I would check those databases, and if you're interested, you could kind of do it yourself as well. All right, let's see what else we got. Next up, the real OC gamer wants to know if there's currently any off-the-shelf method for sending safely attenuated output from an Extron crosspoint to a SCAR input on a CRT or upscaler. Yep, the HD15 to SCAR is as easy as it gets. You take a basic BNC to VGA cable. Those aren't directional, so it can go either way. You might even want to get the 5 BNC cable and only use H-Sync on the output. You plug it into the HD15 to SCAR, and that's it. Now it drops the sync voltage back down. Um, you can use other interfaces. You can build your own. There's lots of other things. You could build a custom cable that has a resistor in the SCART line, but um, that's just the, the easiest thing overall to do if you wanted to do it that way. You just plug it in. So um, if you have the ability to tinker, get a BNC to SCART adapter and put a 470 ohm resistor in, give or take. You could have one of those made as well. But depending on the length and the, uh, the cost, you might actually be cheaper just buying an HD15 to SCART and a longer VGA to BNC cable. So, um, cross point to SCART. Yeah. I'll get the links to the HD15 to SCART as well. I think there's a couple of sellers now. As well. All right, let's see what else we got. Oh, another super chat. Let me um, let me jump into this. Uh, 
Daniel Black, thank you very much for the super chat. Much, much, much appreciated. What's a good method to flash the Fenrir compatible pseudo Saturn Kai firmware to an action replay cart without using disk swapping? Ooh. Um, so, uh, yeah, huh. That's a good question because you might not be able to boot it with a Fenrir installed. You'd have to boot it to a disk first. Hmm. You might want to talk to other people on Discord servers and forums and see if somebody else could do it for you. But I think disk swapping might actually be the only way to do that if you have one of those carts that isn't compatible with, uh, with Fenrir. I have to think about that one. But I'm pretty sure that's uh, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the best way because I guess I should back up for a moment. Um, Pseudo Saturn Kai is a software that you could rewrite an action replay cart with that gives it just a million features. And in order to do that, you need to boot to a blank CDR that could flash it. Now the older Pseudo Saturn Kai firmware isn't compatible with certain ODEs, so if you already have one that's pre-flashed, not just a regular action replay cart, you would, wouldn't be able to get to the Fenrir in order to put that in. So you would have to do something like boot to a CDR. And if you don't have a working DVD or CD drive, DVD drive, a working CD drive, then you wouldn't be able to do that. So I guess I would just talk to people who already have one of those things working and see if they could do it for you. Um, but disk swapping might actually be the easiest. So... Mm. All right, let's go back up. Next up, Felipe Osa uh, wants to know, have I mentioned recording eight millimeter tapes from old composite or S video camcorders on the VHS streams? No, and I haven't had the ability to test that. What I think, I think, total guess, maybe I'm massively full of shit, but what I think would happen is basically the same thing as a VHS transfer. Um, you know, eight millimeter tapes, who knows what frame rate they're gonna be at. Maybe they record at uh, 20 frames a second, like some of the very old ones. I don't really know, but if you're going into a, something like a Tink or a capture card that, with a good filtering, you should be able to just record that as a 60 hertz or 50 if you're in PAL territories, and it should just work. I think all you would need to worry about is the same as VHS, which would be comb filtering for composite and time-based correction to make sure the audio and video stay in sync and to compensate for drops. But I don't have a way to test it. So hopefully I could borrow some 8mm stuff before I do that VHS video, which is another reason why that's just continuously getting delayed, because... I could finish the Tink video by the end of the month, but there's no chance I'm going to be able to uh, do that, do a VHS video, find eight millimeter stuff, find. So yeah, I think I would just, I would just try the same methods as VHS and I think it would be okay. But if anybody knows uh, different, please let me know. I don't want to give misinformation, but I think it should be about the same. see what's next hey koala belmont what's, what's up everybody danielle ew castlemania is there a use case for display port over hdmi um yeah so if your monitor has both ports but you're using an hdmi 1.4 connector but your graphics card could go much higher resolution and refresh rate than that DisplayPort is absolutely going to be the way to go. And in fact, the monitor I have right here is that exact scenario. I can, uh, I think it's an HDMI, it might still be a 1.4, but it could do, uh, so it could do 4K 60 over HDMI, but 4K 144 over DisplayPort. So whenever there's an HDMI limitation, that's when DisplayPort is probably going to be the better way to go. And you would just need to reference the specs on your monitor versus what you're trying to output. But yeah, that, that's a good question. And I, you know, HD, there's a lot with the HDMI association that's um, weird. 
So, you know, using DisplayPort might actually be better in some scenarios, but that's basically the main, the main reason you would want to use it. All right, let's see what else we got. Uh, looks like we're, we're winding down. So I'll take one or two more questions before we go just to, uh, you know, just to kind of close this out nicely. Also just refresh all of the other services to make sure one didn't come in after the fact. <clears throat> I think everybody would probably be here though. Wow, that coffee made me jittery. I really should quit. <laughs> all right, let's see. Frank said uh, they have a pod, a Line 6 pod, and it works decent enough. Yeah, so the one thing that I loved about the pod guitar pedals are the headphone input and output. So you could run your, uh, your phone or computer or whatever else. So if you want to play to backing tracks, which is how I was able to get my timing better, is I don't play along with a band. I either play along to a click, which is boring, gives you a headache, or a drum track. And especially when we were doing band stuff where I would pull just the drum recording out of a practice and play along to that, you get, you know, while the drummers that we use were always great, and, you know, they're humans, so you get those minor imperfections, and I would learn to play along with those, which really made me a much better live player, and one of the easiest ways to do that was using my Line 6 pod, which is only this big, plugging my guitar into it, and that's how I was able to practice in the city, or even when I lived in an apartment in Stanford, it, it just made my life so much easier. So for, for practicing, yes, but for, for live stuff and for recording, I, I, Kemper or original for me. Let's see what else. Um, <clears throat> Marcos Rocha wants to know if I have any recommendations for an HDMI splitter for the Tink 4K. At the moment, the older View HD splitters are the ones I recommend. They don't, they're not sold anymore, so you have to kind of hunt those down. Maybe you could occasionally see them pop up on Amazon. You might have to go to eBay, but they're View HD 1080p 60 with 3D support. Not that you would need that, but those are the ones I recommend at the moment. The newer ones have some weirdness with their chipsets that has compatibility issues with a lot of devices, not just the Tink 4K, including audio dropout issues. So older view HDs at the moment, but I absolutely would, I'm going to keep testing these things and hopefully we could find or make good ones. Um, next, Mr. Adam wants to know if there are more retro Tink 4K videos coming. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I just, time is the only factor. So I'm going to start with the Tink 4K VHS video. Uh, I talked about that earlier. And then I'm going to go back and probably go through some more of the specific things that, um, like the deep dive stuff. And I would absolutely think about doing a scalar shootout video as well. I just think it would only be fair to wait for the morph to have some more time to come out of beta. Um, that way I'm not comparing beta features to features that have been available and working and solid for a year now. I just don't think that would be fair. So, and also just to be honest and blunt, anytime anybody talks about the morph, you basically just take a deep breath and get ready to get dogpiled and attacked. You can get as mad at me as you'd like for saying that, but just go into the comments for like Koala's review was about as level-headed and polite and respectful as you could imagine. Voltar's review was as well. Check out some of the comments floating around on certain Discord servers and certain social medias. You can't even do a good review without uh, getting dogpiled. So I'm going to just put that off until they've worked out some of the beta stuff and wait for the analog modules to come out. And then I'll do some shootouts and hopefully the team would support... Uh, support feedback and not not just let people jump down other people's throats but it's up to them i don't know i don't understand how you could want or how you could expect people to want to review a product that anytime somebody says anything about it they get jumped on so whatever um let's see did i watch wrestlemania no i haven't kept up with wrestling in a long time only because there's just you gotta start picking and choosing your hobbies the older you get the less time you have 
I did love it back in the you know the early 2000s, and I just haven't caught up with it. But I'd like to go see a live match or two someday. I hear nothing but good things about about you know how how good some of the people in there are. Uh, Kamado, uh, my have I considered going to Midwest Gaming Classic in Milwaukee? I would consider any expo, but they have to pay my way. Um, and I, I talked about this pretty deep in a different Q&A, so I'll just basically skip to the end and say I've worked very hard to make a lot of expos, a lot of money, and most of the time you get nothing back for it other than the fun experience of meeting all of you, which is wonderful, except when you've reached a point where you've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars going to these things, not including the time that you're missing where I could have been at home working to make me actual money, uh, you start to realize that it's impossible to keep up with them. So if I would consider going to any expo, but I would have to be, I would have to be compensated and not lose money going to do so, which sucks. I wish I was rich and could just go hang out with all of you and everyone. But basically the only expo you could count on me being at in some form is Retro World because I just, I love the crew behind it. Uh, I still consider them people I, I owe for all the help they have given me over the years. So always can find me at retro world expo and i'd consider going to any others but you just i would have to somebody would have to pay my way for it um did i ever think about making an alternate opening theme for the q a videos no only for one reason because these q a's are always supposed to feel like you and i sat down at a bar or a coffee shop wherever and we're just hanging out having a chat no intro, no outro, nothing fancy. We're just talking. And I want that both because I, I want just a laid back way to interact with everybody. But also, you know, if you and I are sitting at a bar somewhere and I'm like, yeah, I think the Tink 4K has like nine, nine milliseconds of lag, maybe seven. Like, you're not going to like hold me to that exact measurement of perfection when, you know, because then I'll get home and be like, ah, oh, right. It has 2.5 milliseconds. Not, not, oh, that's right. I screwed up. So I like having more of a laid back, less pressure for me. That's why I preface a lot of this with, I'm not sure I'm going to guess at, this is only an opinion because I just want to drive the point home that these things are super laid back. I try my hardest to get all the info right, but there's mistakes in every single one of them just because it's supposed to be a laid back conversation. And I try to always be, you know, just transparent about all that stuff. All right. Well, uh, looks like we are over for this time. So, uh, this is, this was great. This was fun. Um, let's see. All right. Marking off the exit. Yeah, this was absolutely a blast. I really appreciate everybody coming to hang out. Um, this was a lot of fun to do. Anytime there's only a couple of questions on the Q and A's, I'll probably do this. And, uh, now I'm just going to go back and, and clean up the audio a little bit and upload it to the audio only services and, and float plane, of course, as well. But as always, thank you so much for, uh, you know, for participating. Thanks to everybody who supports. And really, I just, I couldn't do this without any of the monthly supporters. So if you are in the position to support and you rely on a lot of the work I do, please consider signing up. And if not, you could always support for free. Go to retrorgb.com forward slash support HTML. There's links there for everything. You could just go buy the same stuff you were going to buy on Amazon for the same exact price, but I get it you know, like a penny on the dollar or something like that for uh, affiliate links and all of that stuff is, uh, is really appreciated. So thank you all so much.